Dr. Jamie Robertson is the clinical ethicist serving the University of Alberta Hospital, the Stollery Children's Hospital, and the Mazankowski Heart Institute as a member of the Alberta Health Services Clinical Ethics Service. She has a doctorate in philosophy from York University and completed a fellowship in clinical and organizational ethics through the Center for Clinical Ethics. She was subsequently employed as a clinical ethicist by the Center for Clinical Ethics providing healthcare ethics support in a range of environments, including academic health sciences center, community hospitals, long-term care, community care, and specialized mental health facilities. Her current role involves supporting careful consideration of ethical issues that arise in healthcare decision-making. Without further ado, I turn it over to you, Jamie. Thank you again for being here. I am going to talk to you all, uh, as promised, about um, some ethical challenges in nephrology care, uh, mostly dialysis. I'll be sort of upfront with that right at the beginning. Um, and what I want us to do is maybe rethink uh, th those challenges. Um, and so I'll take you through a bit of my own sort of um, my own thoughts about about some of the issues at stake. So I'll start off by just offering some pre preliminary comments, mostly to situate myself as well as the presentation. Um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those issues um, and kind of like the kind of normal response I would give, but then also talk a little bit about what some, an underlying connection might be between all of the different cases um, and scenarios that I bring forward. Um, and after sort of proposing my, uh, my sort of, uh, hypothesis for what the underlying connection is, which is that, you know, I worry that um, people who are, who have end-stage kidney disease and who are on chronic dialysis are really not coping well, uh, the people that I see anyway. Um, so after I sort of tell you a bit about that uh, idea, I am going to then talk about what the ethical implications are of, um, you know, thinking about some of these really difficult uh, cases in the nephrology context from that perspective. So I acknowledge that like, especially when we talk about dialysis, like it's offered in a lot of really, like, really different environments, you know, like from, you know, strip malls to hospitals, uh, from, you know, people doing it in their own home in certain instances to these like rural satellite sites. And so, you know, I'm not gonna be able in my comments to speak to everybody's different experiences. Uh, with dialysis uh, in all of those different settings. And I will sort of stay up front that my primary contact with sort of chronic kidney disease and, um, you know, sort of the care for that condition, you know, does have to do with, you know, inpatient nephrology and, you know, sort of hospital-based dialysis. So again, for, for those who are on the line who are coming maybe from a bit more of a specialized perspective, um, you know, that, that will tell you a little bit about what my limits are in terms of understanding some of the nuances of the way that things show up maybe in your work. And so happy for that to be part of the conversation um, as we go forward. Um, the other thing is that, you know, as a clinical ethicist, I don't see all nephrology patients. I see, you know, probably the ones that you in your work might struggle with the most. And so um, I would also just acknowledge that, you know, partly my observations about patients, you know, will have to do with you know, the most sort of challenging cases that probably you see in your work if you're involved in this kind of work. And then the third thing I wanted to acknowledge is um, that a lot of the uh, sort of information um, that I am drawing on comes from this anthology called Psychonephrology. I think the most recent edition was um, released in 2022. And um, it's actually really interesting. So psychonephrology is kind of the study of the ways that like psychological and emotional factors affect those with end-stage kidney disease and, and who are in treatment for that condition. Um, and actually what was really lovely was that uh, when I was first uh, putting together this talk about a year and a half ago um, for a conference, uh, I discovered that actually a lot of the folks who had written the different uh, articles were actually my colleagues at, uh, at the time, St. Joe's, um, in Hamilton, Ontario. And so Azim Ganji, who's there on that front page as one of the editors, is one of the nephrologists there. Um, but also I just want to sort of do a shout out um, to the psychologists who uh, were a really active part of writing some of these chapters. Um, Joe Pelizari, uh, Yelena King, and Tyler Tullock are both, are all three of them uh, folks that I uh, have, you know, worked with 
in my sort of experience uh, with this population as well as others. And I think just psychologists bring such an interesting perspective to this conversation. So um, anyway, all to say that uh, if you are looking for a good resource, this is a really good one. And basically this presentation in a way is like, well, what ethically should we make of the kind of information that's presented in this in this book? All right, so now we're just gonna step back for a second and do a little bit of more of a preliminary, but it's a bit of a history lesson. Um, and so what I'm gonna hope that people might do is um, maybe in the chat since we're recording, if anybody recognizes this picture, maybe you can just type into the chat um, what it is. Um, I will give you kind of a hint that I've made your life really hard by only giving you about half the picture. Um, and I'm just gonna wait for a couple of seconds and just see if anybody um, if anybody recognizes the photo. Uh, when I gave this talk to a specialized sort of nephrology nursing and technologist uh, group, they there was somebody in the room who actually recognized the photo and so again that might just be a factor about the the audience um so i'll just wait for a second to see if anybody chimes in and if not i will i will tell you what the photo is nicely done all right so yes um this indeed as uh one of our sort of participants said in the chat is the seattle committee uh, or at least it's part of the Seattle committee that was tasked with selecting the earliest dial uh, dialysis patients. So thank you so much. Really well done. Okay. So yes. Um, so in the early days, um, right after dialysis was invented, uh, many of you will perhaps be familiar with the idea that, you know, the technology was very um, sort of expensive and not very widespread. And so what happened was that, you know, they had to figure out, well, then they had a resource allocation problem, essentially. They had to figure out who are they going to allow to have access to this new technology, this life-saving sort of a, a technique. And um, and so this is actually where, uh, you know, sort of kidney care and um, clinical ethics end up kind of having a bit of a dovetail in their histories in that they recognized that there was a need for a group that could, you know, kind of provide advice about who to select. And so, um, at this particular uh, Seattle hospital, there was a group um, that was established and it was a few physicians. And as you can see in this photo, um, there is a clergy person. And then there's also there was also a housewife. And so they were um, tasked with selecting who was going to get access to dialysis at their center. And the way that they were going to do it was that they we're going to select people based on social worth, um, which as you might imagine is a bit of a problematic uh, sort of concept. Um, but basically they were gonna choose people based on their age and their sex and their marital status and their income and their net worth um, and their emotional stability and their educational background and their occupation and their future pot potential among like other things. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, that was that approach was you know as you could imagine decried at the time you know it you know definitely reflects the priorities of you know very capitalist motivated um people who are kind of in like the you know in power in a dominant culture so like it's there even at the time people knew that there were problems with this way of selecting people for dialysis and as those who do dialysis or who are involved in sort of kidney care probably are well aware um, the solution to this challenge, this resource allocation challenge, was not to come up with like better criteria, more reasonable criteria for, you know, selecting individuals based on some kind of personal characteristics um, for dialysis. Rather, what happened was that um, dialysis just got kind of funded by the government and then became, you know, very widely available. And so, you know, we don't, I think, as much have this resource allocation problem but other ethical challenges have emerged. And so partly, yeah, we'll loop back to this in a second, but I think, you know, partly some of the challenges might in fact be, you know, arising from how we solved this particular resource allocation issue and, and the way that we, yeah, uh, you know, again, it was, it's great that everybody now basically has access, but that does um, it put aside the question of, of personal sort of 
suitability for dialysis. So what are the, some of the challenges that I hear about in my work uh, from people who are offering patients this treatment? Um, I hear things like, we're struggling with a patient who comes to dialysis as scheduled, but is controlling and abusive toward the staff the whole time. It's really causing a strain on the team and is affecting other patients. And so when I hear about this kind of scenario, you know, I think about a number of different things. Like on the one hand, you know, I guess what's not listed here is out of like, you know, values like beneficence and like respect for the patient as a person, you know, I want to make sure that they still get dialysis. And indeed, as their sort of healthcare team, you know, we have a duty to provide care. But at the same time, the same sort of respect for persons also wants to me to make sure that staff and patients are, are and other patients are sort of not being put in danger during, you know, the go, you know the process of going to, to dialysis. And it's important to recognize that patients also have responsibilities and not just rights to treatment. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think about. You know, and I'll ask questions like, have you done behavior tracking to, uh, you know, detect if there's any triggers that are at stake here? Have we contracted, you know, psychiatry or other mental health resources? Have we set expectations with the patient? Have we developed, a, you know, a care plan that, you know, sort of takes staff safety into account? Have we thought about, you know, the physical layout of the space and how we might use it to, uh, you know, sort of mitigate some of the harmful behaviors this patient has. So, you know, there'll be a lot of things that go into a conversation about how we might manage the situation. I also hear things like, I'm very frustrated with my patient. Their attendance at dialysis is very irregular. They have not made changes to their diet or their fluid intake, despite many meetings with the dietitian, and they just keep getting sicker and I'm at a loss for what to do. You know, and so again, in terms of ethical issues that I think about as I, you know, hear these kinds of cases brought forward, again, I think everybody's concerned about the patient's well-being. Um, and I think that there's, you know, questions to be asked about, you know, are there any systemic or socioeconomic barriers that the patient might be facing, such as the social justice piece that might be causing them not to sort of participate in the way that they might hope they will. Um, you know, but we also might ask about, like, well, decision-making capacity. You know, does the patient really understand how important it is to do these things? Um, and of course, I will mostly hear from the providers, but we'll have to grapple with, you know, concerns around resource use and, and you know, what it means to provide excellent and dialysis or sort of kidney care. You know, and so I'll ask questions like, have you looked into how the patient is perceiving the situation? What are their goals? What are the barriers that they're identifying that might be a challenge to them, you know, doing the things they need to do to take care of themselves? Have we, you know, considered whether there's a way to make dialysis less burdensome or this whole, again, because dialysis is not really like, or responding to end-stage renal disease, it's folks who are in the you know, sort of in this area, no, like it's not just the dialysis thing. It's, you know, as this uh, story also sort of accounts for, you know, all sorts of sort of lifestyle changes that need to be taken into account. So can we make this whole package somehow less burdensome for the patient? You know, but also, again, if we're interested in decision-making capacity, there might be an extent to which we also have to say, oh, well, you know, like they ultimately will make their own choices and those choices might not be the choices we would hope for. So again, this doesn't give you an answer to what, you know, the outcome should be, but it gives you a sense of, you know, the kinds of things that I would offer to care teams in kind of the normal course of things. And then the last issue or kind of issue that often comes up is, you know, around somebody's goals of care. So kind of similar patient to the one on the previous slide, but, you know, it seems like they don't want to live because they keep having these medical crises, but at the same time, they're not allowing us to, to switch to, you know, a different way of managing their illness, like a more conservative approach or sort of a palliative approach. And so many of the same issues, I think, from an ethics perspective arise. And, you know, again, I'll ask questions about capacity. And if the capacity is an issue, you know, have we um, sort of asked if there's other people that need to be involved to help them, you know, Keep, again, take good care of themselves to avoid these medical emergencies. You know, if capacity is less of an issue, and you know, if so a person is, you know, quite mentally um, intact, you know, what have they said when we point out the inconsistency between their behavior and then the the outcomes um, that they're getting? And then the other piece, you know, often becomes, you know, if they're having medical emergencies all the time, have we also talked to the people who would be in charge of making response or of who would be in charge of making decisions for them um, if they were to get really unwell? Because, 
you know, we want to make sure that there's a clear, you know, if this is the way things are going, we want to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where, you know, a substitute decision maker is kind of blindsided or doesn't know what to do um, if this is kind of a thing that's actually happening, you know, repeatedly. So, you know, again, not that there's an answer here, but just there are lots of things to think about. And one of the things I am hoping that people will take away in terms of a thing, you know, an idea to kind of mull over is this thought about, you know, well, what if actually all of these different issues, we don't, what if we were to not treat them in isolation the way I've just done, but instead, what if we actually think about the possibility that there might be something that connects them? And so I think lots of people know kind of there's a bit of a parable, I guess you would call it, of, you know, like three people walking into a dark room and trying to figure out what's in the room. And, you know, one person says, oh, there's like a big fan in the room. And a person says, oh, there's like a tree trunk in the room. And somebody else says like, oh, there's a boulder in the room. And of course, what they're touching is all different parts of the elephant. They're touching the ear and the leg and the side. And, you know, ultimately, actually, it's all the same thing, even though they're having very different experiences of that thing. And so part of what I want to talk about next is like, well, what might that thing Maybe that's what's happening here. And then if it is, what is that thing? And so my proposal, as I said earlier, is that maybe what we're talking about and what we're seeing in these cases on a more fundamental level is that people, some people are not coping well with their kidney disease or with the treatment. And so we'll talk about what the implications of that are. But first I'd like to start us by thinking about like, well, why would we think that kidney or you know sort of um, end stage renal disease patients are struggling, um, especially those who are on chronic dialysis? And so I'm going to go through three different um, sets of factors that we might think uh, are evidence or provide a reason to believe that um, these patients have you know, reason to struggle. Uh, so one is going to be kind of on a mental health basis. Um, I'll also talk about social stressors. And then I'm going to talk about something else, which is kind of like this mismatch that people might be feeling um, with chronic dialysis. So even if we conceive of, you know, mental stressors as like meaning or as referring to, you know, diagnosable mental illness, um, what you will see, and this is again from mostly taken from that psychonephrology uh, anthology that I told you about earlier, um, you'll see a strong association between end stage kidney disease and psychiatric comorbidities. So, you know, again, 20, as you're seeing on the slide, 20 to 50 percent of end stage renal disease patients also have major depression. 19% also have anxiety disorder. I'm not sure how all of those things overlap. So, I don't know. Again, I don't know that it's like fair to say that, like, you know close to 70% possibly have some kind of psychiatric disorder. But again, like there's, it's a very prominent comorbidity. And again, we don't have to talk about causality. In fact, I think the psychonephrology book is very interesting in like really trying to avoid, you know, discussion of causality in terms of like, you know, does being on, you know, chronic dialysis cause depression or the other way around or whatever. Like they don't talk about that, which is fair. But what you can see is that like, Folks who are going to have both end-stage renal disease and, for example, in the second bullet, depression, are going to have a harder time keeping themselves well. So um, if they also have a depressive disorder, they're going to have more frequent hosp hospitalizations, evidence shows, lengthier hospital stays, higher rates of dialysis withdrawal. And again, depending on what that means, maybe that's not the worst, but we'll talk about that. But just in general, they're not going to do as well. Um, and this alone really suggests that it would be very appropriate for, you know, there to be very robust mental health or connections between mental health services and nephrology services, you know, given that they have so many people who might need both kinds of care. Um, and my sense of things, at least, is that, you know, there often is mental health um, sort of support available, but mostly in connection with transplant programs. And I think one of the things that, you know, is kind of potentially unfortunate is that perhaps the mental health sort of resources are, are not as sort of um, available as, you know, this kind of data would suggest would be appropriate. But I also think we need to be careful about how we talk about mental health 
Um, and this, I think, would be like one of my critiques of that, psycho that psychonephrology uh, sort of anthology, if I had one, which is just they do take this very like medical, clinical um, approach to thinking about mental health. And I think that there are three, you know, sort of risks with that approach. So one is that, you know, I think that there's all sorts of ways in which suffering or like mental health kind of stress might not actually end up being the kind of thing that would be detectable as a disorder, either because, you know, um, it's sort of maybe like a more, it's a kind of response that doesn't qualify. So like my sense is, for example, if somebody's experiencing grief, like that doesn't count as a mental disorder. That's like a different thing. Um, and, or, you know, and probably would require um, some sort of difference in terms of context in order for it to be recognized as a disorder. So that might be one thing, right? Like people might be grieving their chronic illness and the changes in their life. Um, and that might not still count in like the disorder, like that's really super clinical um, context in quite the, or like approach in quite the same way as I understand it anyway. Um, it might be that people are suffering, you know, mentally, but they, uh, you know, it doesn't amount to, or doesn't rise to the threshold of a disorder for some reason. And then there's some interesting work. I don't know. It was like, I read the English language abstract of a paper that was in Greek. So it would have been nice to read the whole paper, but this paper in there are kind of summary was suggesting that, you know, um, people who are, you know, sort of have end stage renal disease and who are undergoing dialysis, um, you know, might also be developing sort of person more personality related sort of changes rather than, you know, sort of mental disorder type changes. So like being more highly neurotic, for example. And like, I don't know how that would fit into this idea of, you know, sort of the medical model of sort of uh, psychiatric, you know, sort of treatment and diagnosis. Um, and so again, so there's like, there might be some reasons to think that we're not gonna capture everybody basically, that's my first point, if we sort of use a highly clinical understanding of what it means for somebody to struggle mentally with, um, with their kidney disease and with the, you know, things that are required for them to sort of manage that disease. Um, the other thing I think I would say is that, you know, if we insist on this like super clinical, super medicalized framing of like mental well-being, then, you know, some patients might just never engage on that in that way, because, you know, as we all know, mental health is highly stigmatized. And so, you know, it might be just like practically or pragmatically better to, you know, just not insist on, you know, kind of some sort of diagnosis before we recognize that somebody might be struggling, because otherwise we might lose opportunities to intervene that might exist if we don't, you know, sort of insist on those labels. Um, and then the last thing, and I think that this is actually uh, coming from one of the articles that uh, Joe Pelizari, my one of my colleagues from uh, St. Joe's Hamilton, uh, contributed to was, you know, also like a sort of psychological and psychiatric sort of just very strict approach from those traditions. Well, we'll hope that somebody will, or their aim would be that somebody would adapt successfully, you know, come to terms with their illness and then develop better coping strategies. And I guess one of the things I worry about is like, maybe some of our patients will never get that way. And so, you know, again, think it might be appropriate to think more broadly about what it means to struggle and how to support somebody in that struggle without necessarily achieving the end that, you know, maybe a, psycholo like a psychologist might ideally want. So again, I'll be interested to hear what people think uh, in terms of um, character, if their experience is mapping on to sort of my characterization here. But, but this, these are the kinds of things that I worry about if we kind of get overly narrow um, with the way we think about sort of medic, like mental health um, in this population. And I think we can probably just reframe things um, to just uh, you know, be, you know, very kind of straightforward, use kind of, you know, very everyday language, you know, to talk about, you know, the reality um, of end-stage renal disease and of chronic dialysis, um, you know, that can be mental mentally stressing. So, you know, it's unrelenting, right? There's, this is not the kind of disease, I mean, this is like any other chronic disease, but it's not the kind of disease where you go, you get treatment, and then it's done, you know, it just keeps, like, this is, forever now and also to the second bullet point it is changing constantly and you know you're not going to be able to predict necessarily when you're going to get better or or see any improvement and then you know the idea is that presumably it will be actually more likely that you'll get worse 
Um, and so, but again, the, the stability isn't quite there. There's a big change for people because they will go now into being, you know, in this state of being dependent on other people, healthcare providers, as well as on these machines. And that might be hard for people to sort of grapple with mentally. And then again, this lack of control that comes with, again, not being able to really um, tell where this is going and be able to kind of undo the situation and the like the way in which control gets, you know, sort of given up in this dependence on machines and the healthcare system. So like those are all factors that probably could be very easily sort of understood as being a stressors from a mental perspective for um for people who have end stage kidney disease, again, without necessarily having to use kind of super clinical terms. And then there's other social factors as well that end up being stressors. So, I mean, again, I, as I kind of alluded to before, you know, treating end stage renal disease is not just, you know, one facet, it's a multifaceted thing. And so people's lives kind of do get quite disrupted and quite medicalized, right? The idea that, you know, everything that you put into your body now is like, you know, scrutinized through this medical lens um, and the way in which, you know, you have to now, you basically have a part-time job that is going into the dialysis center to get, uh, again, your renal replacement therapy. You know, all of that is quite disruptive, um, just of life in general and kind of recasts your life in a way um, that is very different from the way that people live normally. Um, and then there's changes in social status, right? Especially when we think about the disruptions around, um, you know, having to go into dialysis two or three times a week for multiple hours each time. You know, if you had a job or other responsibilities, you know, that kind of goes out the window. It's hard to maintain those kinds of your your previous sort of social obligations and your previous social roles with this new, um, you know, kind of set of commitments that you're having to make. And then in addition to that, again, there's the dependence piece. So, you know, now maybe having more, a, a different relationship with some of the people who are closest to you, where, where you may be more dependent on them. And that kind of changes that relationship dynamic. So that could be very hard. Um, and then there's the way that social, the social determinants of health interact with all of this. And I'll just outline sort of three things that might be worth thinking about. So one is that, um, you know, one sort of, Social determinant of health has to do with income and employment. Um, and at least the US data suggests that 70% of people who are on dialysis are unemployed. Um, so that not only affects their socioeconomic status, but again, if they go from working to not working, um, then they again will have this change in social status that they have to kind of get their self, themselves, you know, to kind of think through and adapt to. Um, Another factor is social supports. Um, and so again, if we have, you know, folks who um, are, you know, sort of very isolated, then that is gonna sort of influence their dialysis and their sort of end stage renal disease journey because, you know, uh, there's evidence to suggest that social supports such as family structure and cohesiveness um, are ways or like are, an important part of sort of what helps people, um, you know, adhere to their treatment plan. And then the last thing I'll just point to is uh, culture. And so we can think about a number of different kinds of cultural factors that might make end-stage renal disease hard for people to kind of wrap their minds around or, or cope with. And I will give two examples. So one is that in some cultures, you know, chronic illness is very stigmatized. And so end-stage renal disease patients may no longer enjoy the same level, like the social status, and they might not have the social support um, that they would have had previously, again, because of stigma, potentially. And then the other thing that I often think about, especially when I'm thinking about um, the, the male patient who I am called uh, in response to, um, is that, you know, many cultures have, you know, very specific, you know, masculine gender norms um, that sort of are really focused around independence and strength and control. And, you know, dialysis, especially if you're going to in-center dialysis, you know, requires passivity and dependence. And, you know, so again, there might be real conflicts or tensions between kind of the things that people think are important about who they are as a person 
um, and then you know what dialysis requires of them that could be really challenging, again, as stressors that might be associated with something like chronic dialysis. Okay, so those are like the mental stressors and the social stressors that I want to talk about. Then there's this kind of more, I don't know, like, I don't know, like just maybe intangible um, piece that I want to get to. And so Michael, I'm gonna ask you actually to launch that poll um, that you have created for me. And so you should see a poll here on your screen. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is to choose from my list here um, what dialysis is for. Um, and these are things that I came across in my reading um, as I was preparing the, this presentation the first time. Um, and I just want you to, yeah, like sort of select what option you think, um, yeah, sort of seems most right to you. Okie dokie. Oh, great. Okay. I think everybody responded so that, oh, pretty well. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what was great, uh, if you're able to see the responses, is that, I mean, so on the one hand, most people chose kind of the last one, at, which is, I think, the most neutral one, which is fair. Um, but, you know, the, there were people who selected the first one about, you know, dialysis is for, you know, restoring participation in work and community and therefore quality, dignity and autonomy. Um, there were a couple of folks who chose the um, sort of quality of life option, that third to last option. There were people who chose the second to last option, which, I mean, um, like, fair enough. You know, in terms of, you know, it is this potentially really challenging thing to live with. And I think the first thing I want to say in terms of, you know, the ways in which people might be, you know, not matched well with dialysis has to do with all these options. And so I think that there's like two things worth noticing. So one is that, you know, any individual might ascribe to like one or more of these different things in terms of the like meaning that dialysis has for them in their life or what they think dialysis is going to achieve for them. And so, you know, one of the things we might worry about is that, you know, if somebody thought that doing dialysis was the way that they were going to get back to work or back to community participation, um, or if they thought that this was the way that they were going to get dignity and autonomy and none of that happens, you know, then that's going to be a real source of frustration for this person. Likewise, you know, if, um, a patient thinks that dialysis is going to be just their bridge to a transplant and that transplant, you know, donor organ never comes, you know, that's going to be a big, big frustration for them. Um, if somebody thinks that dialysis is going to help restore their quality of life, and then they find that actually there's some ways in which dialysis, you know, does maybe keep their life going or whatever, but it has really hard and um, unpleasant impacts on their quality of life in different ways, you know, then that's going to be a source of frustration for them. Um, and then, you know, so, you know, there's a kind of tension that might arise between ex patients' expectations and then the reality of dialysis. And then when it comes to that, you know, second to last option, the one about dialysis being a necessary evil, we might think about, you know, what it might be like to kind of carry that with you, that this is the thing that you're, you know, you know that you have to do it, but you don't like to do it and how that would feel because sort of coming with you as a feeling every, you know, every couple of days to the dialysis center um, and how stressful that might be. So that's one source of potential, I think, mismatch that people might experience with respect to dialysis. And again, just this, either internally kind of fraught 
sort of sense of what dialysis is for, or again, um, one where there's a disconnect between expectations and reality. The other thing that I thought was actually quite interesting um, was as I was doing some reading, and it's like older literature, so I'm not sure what happened to this whole research program, and one day I would like to know. But there was this other set of literature that talked about, you know, patient personality traits and how that might um, allow them to do better or worse with the dialysis in general, or like might sort of or personality traits that might allow them to be more successful with, with one like approach to dialysis versus another. So in that vein, you know, um, again, it's old, old evidence from way back in 2002. Um, but, you know, the idea of, you know, um, potentially people with high conscientiousness as a personality trait doing better in dialysis, whereas people with high hostility as a personality, personality trait, you know, not taking direction very well and presumably therefore not doing as well with dialysis. And also this idea that like actually people who have different kinds of personality traits and coping styles doing different better with different kinds so um, of dialysis. So uh, there was a finding that like people who have a highly active or vigilant coping style would do best with home dialysis, whereas people who are less active or who have kind of more avoidant approaches to co coping, you know, might actually do better with in-center dialysis. So um, one of the things I want to point out about that is that, like, you look at the, you know, number of people that who are on dialysis who are presumably unemployed, right? Like, they, they at least the U.S. data, again, was 70%. And so presumably those people are on fixed budgets. I mean, you think about home dialysis. I mean, you have to be able to, my understanding, you have to be able to, like, modify your home, and you have to be able to afford those modifications. And, you know, somebody who maybe doesn't have that, you know, the, who isn't employed, might not have the economic status to do that. They either might be renting and or just not able to afford to pay for the changes to their home. And so, you know, even if they had, you know, even if we knew that they have a, you know, a coping style that's like quite active, they want to be able to like do things, you know, and plan and, you know, strategize, you know, their economic situation might put them in the plate or in the position where they have to receive a form of dialysis that's actually less well suited to them. So all of this last little bit here was just to point to this additional set of stress stressors that I don't know that we always recognize um, for these kinds of patients, which again, just has to do with things about them or their expectations that might not connect terribly well to this process of undergoing chronic dialysis. And so if people are under stress, then they have to cope, uh, right? They have to come up with strategies to manage that stress. And some people do it just fine, um, and some people don't. And so, um, you know, I did some like looking online. This is not exactly the most like scientific, but, you know, looking for like what are some of the ways in, in which people cope poorly or that like reflect poor coping. Um, and so you can see here a few examples. Um, and then I've kind of written maybe a description of what a patient who's doing this might do. So, you know, a patient who's in denial, you know, might not be following their plan, but then also won't change their goals of care because they can't, you know, um, acknowledge the hard truth of, you know, what life or what their life sort of um, prospects would be without the dialysis. For example, people might become overly sort of self-assertive or overly orderly. Um, and so, again, you can think about you know, those patients who kind of micromanage the staff or um, who want their care provided in like just a very particular way. Um, and so that might be a sign of poor coping, maladaptive coping in those patients. The aggression piece, you know, people lashing out verbally or physically at staff or others in their environment. Again, potentially a maladaptive coping style. And then this disengagement and avoidance thing, the idea that like maybe the patients are just, you know, not attending trying to ignore the issues. And again, that might just be them not coping well. And so when we think about, again, these cases, you should be able to then potentially see the way in which, you know, this hypothesis of poor coping kind of gets reflected in those cases of like, 
okay, we have this patient and they come, but they're super aggressive. Well, we've seen from some of the psychology literature that that might be a not great coping style. And likewise with the other three, where perhaps they're more avoidant or denial type reaction. So I'm going to sum up here before moving on to just some of what I take to be kind of the ethical implications of taking on this maybe way of thinking about what might be happening with some folks who are kind of in the kinds of cases uh, that I'm often drawn into. So the first thing I've said is that dialysis, I think we have lots of reason to believe dialysis um, can be a real struggle, right? Emotionally, socially, et cetera. Um, and that patients will have, for that reason, very different relationships with dialysis, depending on the ways in which it creates stresses for them or the ways in which their expectations and way of being might or might not be super consistent with what dialysis requires of them. Um, so, you know, like fortunately, right, we no longer live in the world where we have to have some committee that makes a decision about whether or not a person has access to dialysis. And I think that that is appropriate and good and probably the better way for, you know, our society to be. Um, and so instead we have this shared decision-making model where, you know, providers are supposed to talk with patients about, you know, what their perspectives are to try and come to a decision about, you know, how to manage their end stage kidney disease. But I think it's probably important to acknowledge that probably people are choosing dialysis. Well, I mean, actually from Tyler, <laughs> I mean, um, my colleague at St. Joe's, you know, I think one of the things that he told me was that, you know, oftentimes people don't actually actively make a decision to go on dialysis. Instead, they end up with kind of more of a default thing where they have some kind of medical emergency and then they are put on dialysis and that just becomes their life. So that's like number one. But number two is even for those who are choosing uh, or, you know, as they are choosing to continue dialysis, you know, they might be under a number of different kinds of pressures to do so. I mean, like, firstly, Again, usually this is a way to prolong and or at least assure the prolongation of their life in a way that conservative management maybe isn't. And so, you know, there like there's you know probably just on one level the will to live in itself, you know, pushes people maybe toward dialysis in a way that is you know hard to resist. Um, and then in addition, you know, there's going to be lots of pressures that they're under, you know, in their, for, for example, family relationships, we could imagine where, you know, people might choose dialysis more because that's, you know, what they're, you know, because their loved ones don't want them to die or they can't, you know, let their loved ones down and those kinds of things. So for whatever reason, you know, it seems like people are choosing to participate in this intervention. And for some of them, even though they have made this choice, you know, we can see how there is this like fundamental perhaps incompatibility <laughs> between them and dialysis. And I worry that it's those folks that I tend to encounter most often. Um, and that, you know, perhaps what we're seeing as the ethical challenge in the care of that person is more of a symptom of an underlying struggle that this person is having. Okay, so now I'm, so, I will move on now to just thinking about what some of the practical eth ethical implications are of thinking about, you know, at least some dialysis patients in this way who are, again, having these kind of hard behaviors. So one is that you can kind of think then about like the big picture in which these patients find themselves, right? And whether or not, um, you know, our system and our way of providing sort of kidney care is set up well to sort of treat the whole person and particularly to address the struggles that people might encounter. Um, and again, we might be able to address some, but not all. The second thing is, you know, if we think that people might be struggling, like, are we actually able to identify that struggling and predict who might struggle um, and develop, you know, person-focused interventions? And I don't know that we have the tools at this point to do that kind of work. I'll be curious about whether folks um, have, have seen that kind of stuff. Um, there's also like a real kind of um, relational piece to all of this, which is like also though somebody's struggling, we need them to feel safe enough in their relationships with their care team to be able to acknowledge their suffering. Again, hopefully maybe not putting it always exclusively in like, you know, mental disorder terms, but even to acknowledge a struggle can be um, something that is not comfortable. And so, you know, how do we try and allow relationships 
that um, allow people to be able to express that, that struggle. And then for, again, the last big picture thing I have is around um, patient struggles that we might not notice. So I gave you like four um, different like names of potential ways to not cope well, maladaptive coping strategies. But like, I mean, depending on what you read, you know, there's like a whole bunch of different other ones. And, you know, some of them have to do with like excessive compliance and excessive kind of um, subordination to other people. And so like, I also wonder about how many people are struggling, but they struggle or they cope in a different way, potentially still not an adaptive way, but we don't notice it because it's not a clinical issue, right? They're still very adherent. And so, again, those are some of the big picture things that I think about um, as I think about the implications of thinking about some of these struggles in this, or some of these ethical challenges in this way. The other thing that thinking about you know, the patients who are in these kinds of ethically challenging situations, again, in this through this lens, is that we can think about prevention, right? We can think about, you know, can we screen for mental health concerns? Can we screen for what stressors, mental and social that these folks or patients might be under? Can we screen for personality? Can we screen for coping styles? And try and kind of get a sense of like, who might have trouble down the road and who might not, even if they're kind of okay for the moment. Um, I definitely think that, you know, there's a room for a conversation around broader psychological supports um, to kind of help people with the coping process. And again, I think some of that exists, but I don't know whether it's enough and we can talk about that. Um, and so I've given some ideas, but, you know, who could provide that psychological support? And then again, in terms of prevention, and I say this on inpatients unit too, this last point, which is like, you know, if people are around long enough. You know, we can't treat healthcare, in my view, in this like very transactional, like, you know, interaction to interaction way. Like we need to actually consciously build relationships. And this seems like the kind of scenario where that kind of thinking would be appropriate as well, just given that, um, again, these are patients who are going to have con continuous and ongoing um, contact with the healthcare system and probably with like a particular team, like at their dialysis center or their special, like their nephrology specialist. And you know, so part of that reality then can be thinking very carefully about how we build relationships. And I want to highlight this last, this kind of second whoop bullet uh, or like second feature just of this sub bullet in particular, because I think like there's lots of like they have lots of contact and they see, you know, the dietitian or whatever, like quite regularly, but always in the context of like, are you doing what we wanted you to do? And, you know, maybe there's a different conversation to be had just around like, well, how are you as a person? And, you know, I don't know whether we're having those conversations, but maybe you all can tell me. I also think that there's, if we're thinking about dialysis patients who are, you know, again, kind of featuring in some of these challenging situations in this way, then there's ways that we can also think about maybe the challenges that our own per, like framing as providers might, um, be contributing to the situation. So one piece is just around, you know, like I think we all know that we can't, we should not be calling our patients difficult. One of the uh, sort of papers in the um, psychonephrology anthology very enlightenedly said, oh, well, what instead we should call the relationship with that patient difficult. And I think actually this lens offers an additional kind of reading, which is like, actually it has nothing to do with the patient or the relationship between the provider and the patient it has to do like with the relationship between you know the patient and the treatment for example or the condition and you know so again it kind of like takes off some of that personal like aspect of the kind of challenging interaction um again it doesn't you know make it better that people you know are still getting yelled at or whatever but at least maybe again it can we can think about the challenge lying you know, in a different place. And then hopefully this lens also kind of highlights the ways in which, you know, like, yes, your goals as providers might be frustrated in caring for some of these folks, again, like the ones who aren't sort of taking as good care of themselves as we would hope, but like they may have a whole other set of things going on. So even though like we as providers might be feeling stressed or defensive or helpless or like they're not doing our job, you know, that set of reactions are, those are our reactions and we can own that a little bit um, and see them as distinct from the experience of the patient um, and the very kind of different reality or experience the patient might be having.
And then lastly, I think that there's some implications for intervention. I actually, I saw one of these points actually already in the chat. So I wanted to thank them for that, which is somebody already picked up on the second bullet, which is, you know, it's really important to, for patients to be able to exercise some degree of control and to be empowered. And I put a little star here because I think, again, as the person in the chat said, you know, it's important to be doing this kind of from the beginning, uh, you know, and because I think one of the things that often I encounter is like, you know, where um, there may be patients who either from the beginning or who during the course of their experience with dialysis come to have some of these very like controlling behaviors. And like those are the folks where, you know, giving them more control may actually not be, it might be a disservice. It might not be an appropriate response. Um, but certainly I agree that like for most people, most of the time, you know, let's try and figure out how they can have control and empowerment so that then they can feel, uh, you know, maybe some less stress around all of this. And then, um, you know, this first bullet point kind of gets to where the last bullet point or the last slide left off, which is just like, maybe is there a way that we can like think about what it means to do, you know, to manage and say kidney, kidney disease in a way that, you know, is less burdensome on patients. And even if it's suboptimal, and I get laughed at every time I say that, but like, I'm gonna keep putting it out there until you know, I get some uptake. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, again, we can probably address some of those social determinants of health issues. And I think they do often do, especially around like transportation, but I saw a paper where the other thing they pointed to was like, what also can we develop a relationship with a food bank where there's, you know, um, you know just kidney friendly foods that are like part of what they get you know, a patient gets provided through like a specialized food bank. So I think that there's ways that we can think about, you know, again, addressing those social determinants of health. So I hope that that has been helpful for folks in terms of just thinking about like, maybe we, we can place the issue in those ethical sort of scenarios, uh, ethically challenging scenarios, in maybe a slightly different place. And I hope that you can see that maybe that opens up some different ways of thinking, not only about, you know, kind of, the strengths and weaknesses of the systems in which we operate, but also about prevention, about our perspectives as providers, as well as intervention. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap up there, and we do have a few minutes for questions. <laughs>